I'm a system neuroscientist. I'm working with uh, animals, mostly rodents, but I'm interested in pretty much the same issues than many of you in this organization. Today, I'd like to talk about three interconnected things that I assume will also interest you. The first question that I'd like to address is, how did we inherit our neuroscience framework? And the second related thing is, how did we did cognitive mechanisms emerge from the brain over evolution? And then, again, another related territory I'd like to discuss is, what is the alternative to the current dominating blank slate model in neuroscience? Neuroscience has inherited this paradigm from a philosophical framework which portrays the brain, or more precisely, the soul and the mind, as a tool to learn about the true nature of the world. Early thinkers used introspection, gave name, multiple names, various names, to mental operations, and now, millennia later, we search for our neural mechanism that might relate to their dreamed up ideas. That's an interesting thing. So what I'd like to do today is address these issues, and to give away my answer is that, at least for the last two questions, action or output of the brain is my alternative. So, if, if neuroscience, or let's say psychology, has a birth date, it would be probably 1890, the publication of this fantastic volume by William James. And if you look at the content of this volume, you will realize that today's neuroscience lives within the vocabulary of the titles of this chapter, uh, the, the titles of the chapters. Everybody in the audience can look at it and say, ah, I identify myself with one of the chapters. I'm working on attention. I'm working on perception of something. I'm working on memory, imagination, sensation, and so on. So all of us can sort of sort out where do we belong to in neuroscience. Now, this is an interesting thing is, of course, because all these terms were concocted by people who had no clue about the brain. We inherited this vocabulary and somehow accepted the idea that they are real. And then we try to understand the brain mechanisms of these ideas with the same kind of boundaries that exist in our minds. Now, let me point out the difficulties with this idea. If this outside in or input output or perception action framework is the right framework, uh, which started out, as I said, with philosophy, that the goal of the brain or the function of the brain is to learn about the truth and the very difficult features of the world, then we have to translate this perception or these incoming inputs into some outputs. Now, this translation is done by a hypothetical mechanism, which we can call black box, intervening variables, information processes, representation, consciousness, home includes decision-making, even free will. And of course, this is a big bottleneck. But if this is the right track, then we have to put all the resources that we have now is to understand this middle part. We have to understand decision-making, we have to understand the home includes and so on in order to understand what the brain does. So I'd like to advocate an alternative, which I call inside out organization or internally organized uh, brain. It starts out with the idea that the brain is a self-organized system and its main job is to predict the consequences of its action and to understand what is the meaning and what is, why is it useful for the survival and prosperity of the body. So starting with the internally organized patterns, the brain can generate an output. The outputs will therefore in, in turn influence the inputs our perceptions. Now, if you take these two inputs as uh, two separate uh, entities, then of course, many things will be placed in different boxes. For example, in the outside in framework, we start out typically with specific and we are trying to generalize it to make abstractions from the features of the world. In the inside out framework, we go the other way around. We start from good enough, the brain generalizes, nothing is new to a, new, to a, uh, to, to a brain, everything is, is, is already related to something else, 
But when the details in the environment, for whatever reason, become important, this is when the brain zooms in and tries to understand the specifics. So, of course, the, the vocabulary that I showed you uh, is not exclusive. Many, many other ideas have been made up since 1890. And I collected a bunch of them here that are associated with the so-called functions of the prefrontal cortex. Typically, when we have trouble in identifying an, an existing term or expression with any other part of the brain, then we put it in the prefrontal cortex. And this cartoon shows why it is a, a almost hopeless exercise. There are too many terms and too few brain regions. But that's not the main problem. The main problem comes with the fundamental fallacy of the outside in with so-called representation of favor is because the arbitrator of the relationship between what happens inside the brain and what is outside the brain is the experimenter. The experimenter is in a privileged situation in the experimental setup because he or she is the only agent which has access both to the outside world, in this case the rose, and the internal patterns in the brain, such as spikes or ball signal or whatever your favorite measure is. And of course, the big problem with this, as philosophers uh, tell us, is that this only way, or this one-way communication, doesn't give you grounding. And the main problem, and the main explanation for this, is that these neurons that are responding, so as to speak, to the rows, have no clue what's going on in the outside world. All they know is that there are neurons upstream from the recorded neuron, that have they send outputs and they send action potentials to our recorded neurons but the outside world is totally unknown well the only way how we can get a second opinion and this is what is needed for grounding we need another input to the same neuron so this neuron can compare the change that is produced by something which is the outside world with something else and the answer is that something else is action so this is a redrawing of this cartoon, the Descartian cartoon, showing that a fundamental organization of the brain is that every output system, everything that sends an action uh, command to our eyes, to our hands, to, to our endocrine organs or anywhere, at the same time will send back a copy to the sensory systems. So the brain, whenever it sends out an action, will inform the rest of the brain that I generated something against which the rest of the brain has to compare the changes that are experienced by the sensors. This is called the corollary discharge or efference copy. And this is ubiquitous in all uh, brains in the mammalian evolution. So my big claim is that this action is the source of grounding and this is what can give rise to meaning of many of the perceptions that we have. This is the mechanism which tells us that uh -huh, I am the agent of my own actions and perceptions. And to simplify what I was trying to say here, the only way to understand that sticks in water are not broken is to move them. Once we start moving them, we can have a information provided to the rest of the brain which no amount of inspection will, will, will offer. So if that is the scenario, we would like to know this, what happens over the evolution. How is it possible that from a very simple brain, we generate very complex uh, computation, which we call cognition. So let's move to the next big chunk of my talk, which is the emergence of cognitive actions or cognitive mechanisms. And the idea that I put forward is that cognition is nothing else but internalized action. Now, I have to give you a little background to make this very short sentence, very big claim, understandable. Brains are effective. They can predict the consequences of, those, of their actions. 
they can predict the future because we live in an environment when there are regularities and consistencies. So this very simple brain that lives in a very simple environment can predict the future, it can predict the consequences of, of its own actions in a very simple environment, in a very simple, simple niche, so to speak, and in a very short time scale. Now, over the course of evolution, the, this little loop, the very small loop between the output and the input, is multiplied and many, many loops between the outputs and inputs are added in an organization that is compatible with just what I just talked about, the coronal discharge, that the output always informs the input structures and the rest of the brain. So at one point, the, the brain complexity, the brain becomes, the, the, the brain networks become so smart that even in the absence, the transient or longer, uh, longer term absence of the external world, they can extrapolate and interpolate. What do I mean by that? that the brain learns to predict in a much more complex environment at, at a much longer time scale. What we are seeing is not what's on our retina. You can close your eyes right now and the world doesn't disappear. The reason why the world doesn't disappear is what we are, what we call seeing is in fact is seeing our computation. We are seeing the computation of the brain. So th this is the way that happened over the evolution is that the brain is capable of looking at its own action. And once that happened, then we no longer need the environment to be present. We can come up with so-called what if scenarios. What if I do this? What if I do that? What if I go to the APS meeting? What if I don't go to the APS meeting? What if I turn on the Zoom? What if I listen to this lecture for a long period of time? I can make those vicarious uh, internalized actions without actually acting out. So cognition is nothing less but disengagement of brain networks and its ability to start looking into its own computation. So these are very abstract ideas. I, I have to concretize it and I give you a concrete uh, example. The concrete example comes from my own research or, or, or the area that I'm working in which is memory, navigation, and so on. So evolution initially worked out a mechanism that allows the organism to navigate around the world using cues in the outside world and using cues of its own body. So for example, navigation comes in two flavors. One way to do that is to, even in blindfolded, you can walk around in your room when it's completely dark and uh, from one place to another you can walk you, you, you keep walking and after a while you can go back to the home base because you can keep track of your directions and the number of steps and so on and you can calculate the route back to your home base with some errors and the longer you do that the long the more the errors will accumulate that's why you need to have another anchor which will be available when you open your eyes and then you look at a landmark and this other type of navigation is called landmark based navigation or map based navigation but in order to have a map we have to discover the world we have to go to every single spot here and then do a map and once we have a map then we can not only go from anywhere from anywhere else but even we can go from anywhere to anywhere else when there are obstacles or there are detours and so on so now it's interesting because this is this, this uh, achievement is produced by a system called the limbic system, especially hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex. And this is what uh, represents a very beautiful part of system neuroscience over the past several years. Now, it turns out that the same system, the same hippocampus, entorhinal cortex and its allies, do, do something else. It's called memory, which we can call mental navigation. Now, remember what I said that that cognition is internalized action. So memory is can be conceived that when once we go back to the past, travel back to the past in in our cognition, this is called memory. We can also forward uh, going forward. We can call it imagination or planning. 
But in fact, we are utilizing and using exactly, exactly the same hardware as well as the neural mechanism as we, still, as we use in uh, uh, navigation, except we are no longer relying on external landmarks. Now, it turns out that there's a nice parallel between the two types of navigation that I mentioned, and there are two types of, of memories that we can, we can declare verbally, and this is, these are called episodic and, and semantic memories. Now, episodic memory is self-reference. This is about us. Uh, and in order to go from sem episodic to semantic, we have to strip off the conditions or the context which is associated with many of our personal memories. I will tell you and explain you in a second what I mean by that. Typically, the definition of episodic memory is what happened to me, where, and when. And when, they, when something similar happens to somebody else, or it happens, the similar thing happened to me many, many other times in different temporal and spatial context, then the, this outside package is lost, and what is left is just the fact itself, and this is what referred to as semantic memory. The summary of this figure is that navigation and memory are related. They are supported by the, the same neural substrate. The difference between the two is why navigation we believe, or several people believe, depends on external cues, memory, that is mental navigation and planning for the future, and not. So this is so far very logical and very interesting, but let's see where these ideas come from. And then we go back um, again to, the, to the, our source, which is 1890, William James book, and we will, sign, we will see that, oh, certain chapters are already talked about this. There is perception of things, perception of time, that is when, and the perception of where. And this is exactly what neuroscience did for many, many years diligently. However, the research was done separately. Students of time researchers, they work typically on the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, and so on. Whereas people who were working on spatial issues worked in the hippocampus. So for many years, there was a peaceful coexistence of space and time research. Only recently, space and time converged as one and the same thing, and that caused a lot of trouble. Now, the reason why it happened, of course, is because there is a definition for episodic memory. And here is the definition by its creator, and where Tulving said, episodic memory endows the individual with the capacity to reference personal experiences as explored in the context of both time and space. This was a fantastic advancement because it basically said that now we have a new roadmap of understanding and researching the neuroscience of episodic memory. All we have to do is to understand the representation of the what, the representation of the when, and the representation of the where, store them somewhere in the, the brain in in, by different mechanisms, recombine them, which is the rec recombination of the spatial temporal conditions of what happened to be where and when. And there we go, we have memory. Now, if you think about this definition for a second, then you can say, Mike, oh, this sounds like Newton. Because according to, <coughs> excuse me, according to Newton, space is a container. This is where we can put things in, including our memories. And time is an arrow, so every experience we have can have a timestamp. So this is exactly where we are in neuroscience, working in, within this framework, within this Newtonian framework. But in the meantime, other disciplines, such as physics, have gone further. Since 1915, uh, Albert Einstein's relativity theory, there is no longer space which contains the world. The world is the things themselves. There is no container. There is no space into which you can put things. And there is no time which events occur. So if this is the, the problem and we cannot use space and crutch, space and time as crutches, then how we move forward. So before I make my suggestion, 
let me recapitulate or summarize 50 years of extraordinary research by extraordinary people. This, what I'm showing here, these are elements of navigation. On the left, you can see the head direction system, the grid cell system, the place cell system. And for this audience, I probably, I don't have to introduce them. And at least I don't have to go into details. These are Nobel Prize winning experiments. But just to give you a, a glimpse about what these are, I'm showing you a single place cell here, which is emitted by a hippocampal, single, single hippocampal neurons. This animal, this is a rat running around in a, in a, in a, in a, in a maze. And then you can see that at the particular part of the maze, the neuron is firing. And this firing pattern is called the place field of the neuron. It has many interesting organizational fields, which are not so important for us. But the important thing to ask is that why is this particular neuron fires here? And if this represents this part of phase, then there should be other neurons that are firing here, here, and here. And the argument is that the reason why these neurons are firing one after the other, of course, is because the hippocampus is still instructed by the external world or from the cues from the body. For example, the animal can count the number of stats and so on. So the reason why place cell two fires after place cell one and place cell three, place cell four, why there is a sequence here is because it is caused by external inputs to the brain. Now, if this would be the story, I couldn't give you this talk. The reason why I can give you this talk without any help from the environment is because I have a mechanism in my brain that allows that at the beginning of my talk, a certain assembly that initiated my talk gave the information to the next assembly, which in turn gave this, the information to the next assembly. And throughout my talk, my brain keeps generating assemblies after assemblies after assemblies in a very long assembly sequence. So we can conceive that there is an internal dynamics. The brain, especially the hippocampus, is capable of generating continuous sequences. And these self-generated, internally generated sequences are the foundations of our cognitive, cognitive abilities. So what is the experimental proof for that? Remember that place cells are place cells and they, they, be, they are believed to respond to the environmental cues or perhaps body cues. So we have to come up with an experimental design that somehow confronts this. And this is what we have done with the postdoctoral fellow Eva Pastakova. We train rats to explore the world, explore this maze, to find water when the animal turns to the right, for example. And remember that the reward was collected on the right side of the maze. So next time, the animal has to go to the left. This is a very well tested hippocampus dependent task. The new ingredient that we introduced that in the delay period, an animal has to wait in the start area before the choices, we train the animal to run in a wheel, always facing the same direction, always facing the same direction, and with relatively the same running speed. And the reason why we did that is because we wanted to make sure that cues from the external world will be constant, and cues from the body that come in are also constant. So in our power, we have done everything that there is nothing from the, to the brain, nothing is delivered to the brain that would make neurons change. Now remember, when the animal is running in a wheel, the X, Y coordinates of the world are fixed. So according to the navigation theory, we should find cells that will fire as long as the animal is at this particular position, continuously. And if the animal moves, and only when the animal moves from the position, there will be another neuron or another assembly of neurons that would represent the next position. And of course, this is not what we found. Instead, what we found is the following. We didn't find a single neuron that would fire continuously while the animal was in the wheel. 
what you show in this what I show in this in this graph every line here from left to right is a neuron there's another neuron another neuron another neuron another neuron and then the sequence represent the distance or time while the animal is running in the wheel so these neurons fire at the very beginning of the journey these neurons fire in the middle of the journey and these neurons fire at the end of the journey instead of fire, finding neurons that would fire continuously and saying you are here you are here we find that there are many neurons that, that behave and look like place field, except that one place field is alive for about one second or so, then it gives rise to another one, another one, another one. So you've got this neural trajectory or, or, or assembly sequence that lasts as long as the animal is in the wheel and keeps the memory alive. Now you can argue that, uh -huh, indeed it's not the external world because it's content, but perhaps is the animal is counting the number of steps or some feedback from idiothetic information from the body is coming back. That's certainly not the case because what is shown here is these are the sequences of the neurons when the animal is going to the left. And now the animal is running again the same, in the same way, the same speed, the same uh, number of steps and same everything that from the body. But now the animal is, will be going to the right. And this pattern and this pattern are fundamentally different. So there is something different going on than feedback from the environment or feedback from the body. And if you look at the difference between this and that, then you can say, well, the experimenter at least, and perhaps the rest of the brain can tell the difference which direction the animal will go. And in fact, this is what we could predict. We could predict with 90% accuracy which turn the animal will take 10, 20 seconds later, including errors. So that's a very different way of looking at the system. We are looking at the same system now than before, except that we froze the animal in one part of the environment, but we demanded that the animal remembers something. And the same system that generates patterns or generates sequences or generates place field looking like cells keeps doing the same thing but now in service of memory you also notice, notice probably that instead of showing the distance run or the position of the animal which didn't change i plotted here on the x-axis seconds so from here from the sequential activity of these neurons at any any time point you can look at the population vector, that is how neurons fire relative to each other. You, you can draw a line here and you can make an intelligent guess how many seconds have passed since the beginning of the journey. You can see that uh -huh, the, if you look at the error, that is the error of prediction how far the animal has gone in distance or how far the animal has gone in time, it has a very low error of one or two seconds, even though we have only a hundred neurons or so. If we had a thousand or ten thousand neurons, maybe this would be even lower. That's an interesting thing because now we can predict the elapsed time. Now remember, we have we can predict what happens, which direction the animal goes. We can predict what distance, which is the where. We can predict how many seconds, which is the time. And this observation prompted my good friend, the, the late Howard Eichenbaum, to call this hippocampal cells, not only place cells that John O'Keefe did, but time cells. The, the take home message is that every single cell in the hippocampus can be a place cell or a time cell. And that's an interesting problem. And why is that? Here is my answer. The only thing we measure, the only thing we measure is this neuron sequence shown in the right. And I showed you before that the sequence pattern can also tell you which direction the animal goes, that is the what. But if you compare this sequence against a human-made instrument, such as a ruler, then you can express this pattern against something that you can call distance. And if you take another human-made instrument, such as the clock, you can call this one time. So we have one thing, only one thing that we measure, and we call it by three different names. 
that is distance, duration, or what? Now, we can pause here for a second and say, well, wait a second, there is, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense because then if what you can call one with the other, then how does it work? And the answer is, or the recommendation is, that calling neurons in the hippocampus, either place cells or time cell, is perhaps irrelevant for the brain. For the brain, what matters is how downstream reader mechanism classified these messages. Unless we show separately and explicitly that there are readout mechanisms that read out the what? They read out the time or they read out the distance. We have no right as the experimenter because these correlations were made by us with the help of human invented instruments. So if the hippocampus is a structure which is blind to the modalities, has no clue what the neocortex does, it just computes the same thing over and over and again, and it sends back the information about that, the, the, the results of the computation, then depending how you set up the experiment, you can call hippocampal cells time cells, you can call them place cells, you can call them uh, sound frequency cells, you can call them memory cells, whatever you want. So if this is right, then we have a problem with the definition of episodic memory. Because now we can say that navigation in both physical and mental space is nothing else but succession of neural events. This trajectory is assembly sequence is what determines and, and explains both physical as well as mental navigation. Having said that, then we can say, yes, the hippocampus is now a a general purpose sequence generator. It, has, it, doesn't, it, it cannot help. It generates sequences all the time. In fact, the most difficult thing in the brain is remain stationary. Everything is changing all the time. The sequences occur one after the other. So the hippocampus can be a special sequence generator that encodes content-limited ordinal structure, meaning that it has very little knowledge about what happens in the neocortex, except it can point to the neocortex. It doesn't know the exact contents. And I can use a metaphor of a library and, and, and the librarian. So in this metaphor, we can say all the knowledge that we acquired are in the neocortex, in books, in modules somewhere. But of, and it's very rich. But of course, the usefulness of a library or the richness of a library or for the sake of, of the, for the sake of the same argument is the richness of humankind's knowledge that is available inter, on the internet is only as useful as its searchability without a search engine the knowledge is not very useful so the hippocampus is the brain's librarian or search engine that can point to different can generate a sequence and said oh if you would like to know something about second world war then this is the book you have to read, followed by this one, and this one, and this one, because the hippocampus knows enough about the contents of those books, but not the context themselves. So if this is the, the case, indeed, then the hippocampus is collecting information, not necessarily as a simple indices, but as segments of indices, and they happen to be in a time frame of about 100 milliseconds, which is the hippocampal theta cycle, and then they collect the activities and point to the activities on the neocortex and, and, and generate the sequences to retrieve the knowledge that existed here. So if this is, has some merit, then the, the next question we would like to ask is the third big question is that how are these sequences generated in the brain? If the dominant view of current neuroscience even if it's not, not accepted by anybody nobody will admit that he, he or she believes in the blank slate model but the way we design our experiments the way that how we interpret our hypothesis and the way how we write our papers or how we write chapters in in different books is following the blank slate model so sequences are in according to this framework are generated by experience. 
The consequence of this, of course, is that the complexity of the brain should scale with the amount of experience you have. In other words, the brain changes from very simple, from blank slate, to very complex after 60, 80 years of learning. So according to the blank slate model, which is represented on the left, you start out with a, uh, a system where connections are random and the representation is probably equal. The other way of thinking about it is, is that, you know, there are preformed networks and the brain generates patterns, enormous amount of patterns, enormous amount of sequences without any experience. The, the maintenance, the most important thing of the spikes of many, many of the spikes that neurons generate are devoted to maintaining brain dynamics. This is shown on the right. And after this several minutes of, of my discussion, you know which side I am I'm taking. Now, if the skewed distribution is in fact the rule of the brain, then it should have consequences from the very low level of organization to the very high level of organization. The highest level of organization is, let's say, perceptual level. There are a few laws in neuroscience but one of the fundamental ones that all of us agree, especially this audience, is the weber fechner law, which is a log rule, it's a logarithmic rule that relates initially to sensitivity, uh, to, to intensities, but it applies to perception of both space and duration and to many, many other things that the brain does. What our research supported over the past decade or so is that this Cognitive law is supported by a dynamic that is also following a logarithmic rule. And this dynamic is supported by an anatomical substrate, a connectivity, which also follows a log normal distribution. Now, let me just help you a little bit to go back to high school and, 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 uh, and remember what is the difference between log and linear scale. So the log distribution shown on the top is a beautiful bear-shaped curve in a logarithmic scale. And what is shown in this figure is, let's suppose that you, you record from 10,000 neurons in the hippocampus, 10,000 pyramidal cells, and you determine the long-term firing rate of each of these neurons and you plot it here. And then you got this beautiful distribution. Some neurons fire 50 times more than the others. Now, if you look at the same distribution on a linear scale, this is called a skewed distribution because very, very few neurons are faster firing. The majority of them are slow firing. So this is a very simple scenario. And that's the case everywhere in the brain, whether you go to the uh, prefrontal cortex, the cerebellum, spinal cord, anywhere, the log distribution is the rule. But that's only firing rate. And here's a longer list. Firing rates have a normal distribution, burst probability, synaptic strength, action conduction velocity, population synchrony. In other words, right now, when you are listening to this talk, and in any time moment, you can record from many neurons in your brain, even from the same structure, let's say layer five pyramidal cells in the prefrontal cortex, and ask how many of these neurons, what fraction of these neurons fire together, the answer will be in 100 millisecond chunks, let's say 1%. In the next moment, another times 1%. Every now and then, you will have 20, 30% firing together. Now you look at the distribution of these events that are the magnitude of the synchrony, and you also get a log normal distribution. In other words, very rarely, many neurons will be firing together. Most of the time, very few neurons fire together. So all this dynamic is supported by a macroscopic connectivity, which shows the same rule. Many every area of the neocortex is connected strongly to only a few other areas, but weakly to many, many, many areas. Spine size of a single neuron. Most of them are very small. Some of them are very large. And they show a beautiful log normal distribution. And axon diameter, which is related to action conduction diameter. If you look at the axon diameters, there are, there are axons that are three to 500 times thicker than most of the others. And the distribution shows this log normal. 
So that's an interesting thing. But you can ask is that is it just a statistical curiosity or it serves something? We claim that it serves a very important problem to be solved, namely that it's a brain, it is the brain attempt to reconcile the conflicting demands that neural, neural mechanisms, especially neural networks, have to meet, which is a wide dynamic range, stability, robustness, plasticity, redundancy, resilience, degeneracy, homeostasis. They are all competing with each other. Nature's answers, nature's answer to many of these problems is typically diversity. And this diversity is what I, I explained to you. Now, this diversity, of course, has expressions that you can measure, but it has also consequences of this expression. So, for example, what I'm showing you here is how many representations, if you want, how many place fields a neuron can have. For example, if the animal is exploring an environment, which is in this case is a, is a seven arm radial arm maze, if a neuron fires in one arm, what is the probability that it will fire another arm and another arm and another arm? And the answer is very low, because most of the neurons, 85% of them, are firing only in one arm. But some of them fire in every single arm, and this is a nice exponential decay. And other experimenters did ask a similar or related question, but differently. He said, if you have a map in one environment, or if a neuron fires in one environment, and if you put the animal into another room, let's say, does this neuron fire in another room? Does it fire in neuron room three, room two, room four, room five, room 11? And the answer is most of the neurons are unique. They fire only in one single room, only no room at all. But some of them are firing in every single room. Now, this is very interesting because this means that uh -huh. the same represent the same groups of neurons, they are pretty similar, but they are just different from each other in terms of their representations. One is a generalizer. It says in every single situation, it said, oh, I'm, I'm, I know where I am. It's familiar, familiar, familiar. That was the majority of, of, of they are saying, no, it's, I'm very specific. This is a, a different situation. I'm in a different room. Now, it turns out that the firing rate that I mentioned earlier, has a very strong relationship to these representations. Neurons that are faster firing, which is shown here, these are the faster firing neurons, these are the slow firing neurons, have larger place fields and, and more place fields. The consequence of this is very simple to understand, or at least to think about it. A downstream observing neurons, which gets the hippocampal information, will ask the following question. Many of the inputs that are coming out from the uh, uh, from the slow firing neuron says, I'm in a new room. This is a novel thing for me. But whereas a small minority will say, it's familiar. I'm in the same arm or I'm in the same room. And the problem, of course, or the interesting issue here is that the ones that are the minority have a stronger vote. They got much larger synapses. And these neurons are forming a very interesting organization. The faster firing neurons have longer axons. They are connected to each other better. They receive information not only from each other, but also from the slow firing neurons. In network speak, they are forming a rich club. They have more information. They, they have about half of the information the brain has, even though they are only representing 10%, let's say, of the minority of neurons. So if the slow firing and fast firing neurons are different, one is always saying pretty much the same, whereas the others are specific, then you might expect that in the learning process, their participation is different. So this is the experiment which we design and perform, and they ask the following thing. If the animal is sleeping and we can measure their long-term firing rates, and then we put the neuron, uh, the animal into a novel environment that the animal has never seen before, and we put it back to the home cage for sleep, and we look at nothing else, just the firing rate relationship between them, what will happen? And this is what happened. So this plot is showing firing rate of, of neurons against firing rate of other neurons. Not surprising, the neurons that fire faster have a better correlation. Neurons that are firing 
uh, every now and then, they have a poor correlation with each other. Now, this is during pre-May sleep. This is during post-May sleep, post-May learning sleep. And this is the difference between the two. And the interpretation of the finding is very clear. The neurons that change their firing rate a little bit, as a, but significantly as a result of this maze experience, are the ones that are the slow firing neurons. Where the fast firing neurons, the members of this backbone, this rigid, rich club, are rigid. They are not changing at all. So, just to summarize this part, there, there is a skewed representation of dynamic and connectivity in the brain in such a way that there is a rigid backbone of neurons that are always firing. They are always ready to generalize. They represent, uh, they, 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 they are responsible for, the, for the, at least half of the work or half of the performance of the brain work all the time. But of course, without the majority of the plastic neurons, this brain will be very plastic. But these two dames, two general, or two uh, ends or two tails of these distributions corresponds to functions that I call specific and general. You can call it also novilia uh, versus no, uh, familiar. So the, the, the truth is that we know the unknown, not because we remember it, but because our brains make some kind of a guess under all conditions. Nothing is new to a brain. The brain always compares anything with something else. And this initial gas that is produced by this minority of uh, fast-acting neuron or the fast-firing neurons is good enough under most conditions. Only when there is some discrepancy, when I say, oh, this is, this is the same room that doesn't have any interesting details, but then it turns out that some parts are critical. This is when I go from the general to the specific and explore those details and include and, and mobilize the minority, the, the majority of the plastic neurons. So, where does this lead to us? Well, it leads to us to a very important uh, fork where we have to make a choice. Namely, if we would like to define learning, then we can say, what is learning? Is learning the according to the blank slate model is that we start with a simple brain and then we, we start with a with a with a book with white pages and then we put information and every single situation that happens to in our life will be laid out as a new pattern the alternative one is no brains generate sequences brains can maintain dynamic independent of experience independent of experience however in this realm of possibilities, some of these sequences may gain significance because they can match to some behavior or some interesting things out there. So needless to say that my goal is to discard this possibility. Can I show some experiments that support this idea? Here's one. So going back to the hippocampus and going back to the place rules, we can argue that the reason why this neuron is active in place A and this neuron is active in place B is because its upstream partners and perhaps the inputs from the world are activating this neuron most of the time through the synapses. But what if in the laboratory we artificially change the synaptic strength, the synaptic connections from this assembly to this assembly, you can see these dotted lines are weaker, but we can make it stronger with a mechanism or with a, a perturbation called long-term potentiation, uh, which was uh, very popular in the, in the, in the last century. <laughs> and you can see that with LTP can change it. Question is, do we see a new place? And the answer is yes, by scrambling the synaptic weights in the hippocampus, we could make new place fields or we, can, we could make all places disappear, but not without constraints. So here is an example of a new place field. This is the old place field on, on the left. This is right here. The animal is going in this direction. And we produced a reorganization of the synaptic connections, and then we got a new place field here. But when we went back and visited, it turned out that that place field was already a little bit there. No, we never noticed because it wouldn't pass our criterion. 
but it was there. Now, the critical thing that we have done is compared which place fields or which neurons are willing to change their spatial representations, so to speak, and which ones are not willing to change. And the answer is those neurons that had a very beautiful place field, that they had a high firing rate, their peak firing rate was somewhere between 20 and 40 hertz. They are rigid. No amount of long-term potential could change them. It's the majority of the low firing neurons with a very not so beautiful, not so well-formed place fields are the ones that can be changed. So the two investigators, George Dragoy and Ken Harris, who were postdocs in my lab, went on on their own and expanded it further. So Ken Harris looked at the auditory cortex and came up with this conclusion that whatever responses the auditory cortex can have either to natural stimuli or various tones can happen only within the realm of possibilities that the brain internal dynamics can afford. That is, the brain generates, in this case, the auditory cortex already generates enormous amount of patterns. And out of these patterns, anything that the auditory cortex will experience in response to a auditory input will fall within this territory. George Dragoy did something else. He said, OK, uh, when we put an animal into a new environment, the, the, the signal that I just described, and we take a trajectory, let's say, from the post-learning sleep, and we ask, was this pattern already there before the experience? And then you can compare this line and this line, and the answer is, yes, it was. So the trajectories that are expressed on a new, in a new environment, in a new maze, was already there, pre-formed. It was not put together piece by piece with the help of environmental inputs. Instead, what happened is that when the animal gets into a new environment, even, even when, a, when a newborn animal the very first time leaves the nest, it already has a preformed sequences of place activity. So we can do one thing that we like to do in the laboratory, which is reject a hypothesis or reject a theory. I think many of these experiments, and I just showed you a very short uh, summary of this, are arguing very strongly against the blade slate. So what is left? Well, what is left is a spaghetti. So this, is a, this representation shows that the brain comes with an internal dynamic. There are many, many pre-existing or pre-configured sequences or neural trajectories that are available to choose from. If the occurrence of, of, of any of these uh, trajectories coincide with some meaningful activity, the animal finds a food, the animal finds a partner, and so on, then all of a sudden these sequences or these parts of the sequences gain meaning. Meaning means that it has some advantage for the organism that, whose brain generated that pattern. And of course, there is a flexibility. You can jump from one pattern to the other one pretty easily with the help of inhibition. And you can go from one trajectory to another, another you know, one trajectory to another trajectory instantaneously with very little investment. In other words, in this framework, the brain doesn't change a lot with new experience. Its dynamic is not perturbed. We can learn any amount of novel things without changing our brain dynamic, which is not possible, not possible in the, in the uh, tabula rasa blank slate model. Now, I'm coming to the end of my talk. Let me just summarize that indeed what I have told you in this third part, the brain networks are pre-configured dictionaries. You can conceive these cortical networks as dictionaries that are filled in already with nonsense patterns. The perpetually active brain produces vast amounts of neural trajectories, and these preformed neural patterns are available to be matched with unique experiences. Thereby, the initially nonsensical neural trajectories gain meaning by action based experience. Action is the main and probably the sole source for grounding the significance of sensory inputs. Meaning, is thus neither objective, no absolute, 
but relative to the grounding action and to the brain's existing knowledge base. I know what I was talking about today is pretty complicated. There are many details that are, need to be understood in order to make sense of the three claims that I make today. But if you just agree with some of them, and I know many of you don't agree with me, I recommend this book where you can see many of these ideas fleshed out in detail. Thank you very much for your attention.